Thank you. Welcome once again to the Footballers Football Show on the road. Tonight we're at Blackburn Rovers in the company of, well, he's legendary in these parts, Ronnie Clayton, who had 21 years with Blackburn Rovers, skippered them in the 1960 Cup Final, won 35 England caps along the way. It's nice to see you, Ronnie. Nice to see you. We also have with us Duncan McKenzie, who had two years with the Rovers at the end of the 70s and finished his playing career here. Nobody else would take the risk. Uh, <laughs> we're, we're, deli <laughs> Sorry, Duncan. Uh, we're delighted to have Scotland centre half Colin Hendry with us. He's in his second spell at Rovers, and 18 months ago, 3.3 million pounds seemed a lot of money, but it's not now. Delighted to see Alan Shearer. We're at Ewood Park, the home of Blackburn Rovers. <laughs> Blackburn Rovers were formed in 1875. In 1888, they became one of the founder members of the Football League. But it was as cup fighters that Rovers established a reputation in the early years. 1884 saw the first of three successive FA Cup wins. They won it again in 1890 and 91. League championship wins in 1912 and 1914 made Rovers one of the most successful clubs of the era. In 1928, Blackburn went into the FA Cup as underdogs against high-flying Huddersfield. Jack Roskamp's first-minute goal set Rovers on their way to a 3-1 win and their sixth FA Cup triumph. The years that followed saw relatively little success at Ewood Park. In 1960, Rovers did reach another FA Cup final. This time they were outgunned by Wolves and lost 3-0. Recent years have seen Rovers rebuilding both on and off the pitch. The team that Kenny built is now a match for anyone and is pushing hard for the Premiership title. Last night, the Monday Night Football cameras were at Ewood Park to see Rovers join Manchester United at the top of the Premiership. Wilcox, up towards Newell, headed down towards Shearer here! Chairman started that one off. Yeah. Think, <laughs> 16 points the gap was back in January, and it's closed now. Although we must say immediately that Manchester United do have better goals difference, and they do have a game in hand. But having closed the gap, how does it feel? There was a lot of people writing us off um, around about Christmas time. Um, I think we were the only ones we um, we were the only ones believing we could do it. Um, we're a long way off it. If if we win all our games, that might not be enough. Um, Manchester United are in the driving, street, driving seat. Um, all we can do is, is win all our games and then hope for the best. Bit nervous, bit edgy at times last night, wasn't it, Colin, out there? Well, I mean, we didn't have so well against Everton and Manchester United. <laughs> um, we'd suffered a serious defeat at Wimbledon. But uh, that's the calibre of the lads, really, that you can go on and win games like uh, Manchester United and Everton. We're not going to play well every night, every day. Um, I think the result was more important than the performance last night, as it might be for the rest of the season. So, if we can take the three points, as Alan says, from every game, that's what we're going for. You can't believe it, Ronnie, can you, when you see what's going on here and has happened here over the last 24 months or so? I can't believe how it's happened over the last three years. Um, with the Jack Walker and everybody, um, it's remarkable but what's happened, and, and people can't realise that uh, possibly next year we'll be in Europe and we'll be seeing um, Juventus or Milan or... And good luck to the lads because they, they work very, very hard. Mm. And um, we're not a good club, we're a great club now, aren't we? Yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you what, Ronnie, the, 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 the most impressionable thing there on me that you said was possibly 
in Europe next season. He's, he's speaking the right way, isn't he? Nobody here is he's taking anything for granted. Been having, he's having, been having chats with Kenny, hasn't he? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Down Gleesh speak, isn't it? Yes. Take each game as it comes. <laughs> Managed to understand him, Ron. You did well. I did. I did. <laughs> nice to see you, Duncan. What's nice it like to for you too. coming back in here and, and seeing how it's all changed? Well, I think it's great. I think uh, realistically, I don't think any of us expected even this season for, for Blackburn Rovers to be in a position where they could win the league. Um, I think the whole essence really, if there was a message to give to the fans out there, was to be patient. Mm. You can see the progress that's been made and it's been made so steadily and so well in the last couple of years. And the, so at the same time, you've got all this building program going on. Uh, I mean, I just couldn't believe it, for example, last week when I came to the Manchester United game, the atmosphere out there when there's only three sides to the ground, which was quite fantastic, mm. really. Um, Things have changed, things have progressed. Uh, I, I, I think it's nice that they're in with the chance of winning the league, but I think realistically it, it's one of those is uh, don't be disappointed whatever happens because there's going to be a few quirks to the tail, I think, before the end of the season arrives. And uh, the, the prospects of playing in the European Cup is, is, is just mind-blowing. Mm. Mm. You're also president of the Supporters Association here, Ronnie, aren't you? W what are fans saying to you? Are they as surprised as outsiders like me when they look around here now. I mean, I mean, a year ago we walked in here and it was a different ground. It is. Uh, the whole football world in Blackburn has changed. Um, in my day, going back 30 years, um, all this wasn't anything. You couldn't visualise what it, was, what, what it would be like. But in my day, even my wife had to wait outside in the rain till it changed and gone out after the match. There was no room for her. So everything now has changed dramatically for the great. And, and thanks to, to these lads on the, on the front, it's made it possible to see all this. It's absolutely wonderful. Mm. And nobody would have vis visaged that three years ago would even thought about it. It's wonderful. And yet it's taking shape all around us. Is, is that why you came here? Yes. Um, there's a lot of people said I came here for different reasons. Um, and hopefully I'm starting to prove them wrong now. Um, I came here because I knew Blackbur Blackburn were capable of winning things. We didn't win anything last season. Uh, we might not win anything this season, but I'm sure it might be next year, it might be two or three years' time, but I'm sure there'll be silverware coming here. Mm. Yes, I was, I was recording a programme with the manager this morning called The Boss, which will go out this Sunday on Sky Sports at 1.30, so you'll excuse me if I'm a little confused tonight. It's been a difficult morning. But, uh... <laughs> I did put that to him at one point, that I'd read recently, he'd said it won't be long before silverware comes to Ewood Park. He flatly denied that, but is that an opinion you have, that it, it won't be long now? I hope not. As I said, that was one of the reasons for me coming here. Um, it might not happen this season, but I'm, I'm pretty certain it'll happen, not too distant future. Yes? Yeah. At the end of last season, I'd said that uh, if we were any more successful than what we were when we finished last season, we'll have something to show for it. Now, we've uh, accumulated more points this season than what we did last season. Um, and if we are any more successful, we'll be in Europe. But still five games to go, 15 points worth. Mm -hmm. Sorry for uh, <laughs> going over the old adage that the manager's uh, put to you time and time again, but that's the way it is, you know. Taking each game as it comes. Yeah. yeah. Well, Okay. Right. <laughs> Sorry about it all. <laughs> Not like jokes to be cagey. The only thing is... Uh... That's great, isn't it? <laughs> okay, that's where we'll take a break. More in a moment or so on the Footballers Football Show. Welcome back to the Footballers Football Show from Ewood Park tonight in the company of Blackburn Rovers. Our guests are Ronnie Clayton and Colin Hendry. We also have with us Alan Shearer and Duncan McKenzie. Big crowd, loads of questions, so let's get going. Gentlemen down here. Yeah, so I'd like to ask one on Colin, please. Colin, after... Alan, I know Alan's the best in the league at centre forward. Who would you say is the hardest centre forward you've played against? Uh, well, unfortunately, I didn't play against Andy Cole because uh, I was injured for the two games home and away. Unfortunately or fortunately? Um, unfortunately, <laughs> because uh, I uh, will rise to the challenge or the occasion, whatever it may be. That's fair enough. Um, but in saying that, probably the best striker I've played against must be Gary Lineker uh, when I played for Manchester City. Now, don't, don't boo whatever you do. Um, no, that's probably the best. At this moment in time, I don't have any idea. Possibly Andy Cole, I would say. Well, it must be him in training, surely. Well, uh, I'm sure. Well, probably, He's on my yeah. side on a Friday morning. See, this is it. Yeah. <laughs> 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 
And he thinks he's a centre forward anyway, Alan, That's doesn't it. he? Well, he hasn't <laughs> scored all season, so. <laughs> <laughs> This time. Didn't you want the same question of... Uh... Yeah, I was going to reverse it and ask uh, Alan who, who he feels is the hardest centre-half he's played against, or back four, or whatever. I think they're all difficult. Um, they're all difficult games you go out against. Um, but I think one of the, the, the most difficult teams is Arsenal to play against. They're, they're so well-organised and compact. Um, they don't uh, concede very many goals at all. Um, they've given us one or two hard games this season, and they've got a tremendous back four. You know what George Best said when the same question went to him? Leeds United. <laughs> <laughs> Young man here. I'd like to ask Mr. Shearer one. What did it feel like when you hit that second goal against Manchester United? Hence <laughs> my friend, the goalkeeper. Um... <laughs> Great. I mean, it's, it, to score a goal is, is, is such a great feeling anyway, but to get to against Manchester United was even special. Who, where's the gentleman who wants to ask about goal celebrations? That was over here, was it? Um, after hearing about players being booked for over-celebrating in matches, I'd like to ask um, the panel if th they agree with these goal celebrations these days, like these dances and things like this. Well, the reason I ask that is that Gordon Strachan last night was, was amongst our guests, and he made the point that what he liked most about Shearer and Newell as a strike partnership was the celebration, a good old-fashioned, yes, and it's in. And, 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 and there's no time for any of this, and they hit Wigan, I'm sorry. Have you, have you not worked on a routine, Alan? No, no I can't dance. <laughs> You, you, I can understand people getting excited when they score goals. The, um, you work uh, six or seven days a week um, to stick the ball in the back of the net, and it's understandable when, when you do that on a Saturday in front of 20 or 30, 40,000 people um, why so many people do get excited. Mm. You used to take a couple of minutes and have a cigarette, Duncan, didn't you? Yeah, I mean. <laughs> Yeah, but when you're playing with people like Noel Brotherston and Howard Kendall, you didn't fancy kissing too many of your team. <laughs> It has changed a bit, though, hasn't it? Oh, it has. It, it, it has changed, you know. I mean, they don't work as hard these days as I used to do, but... Uh, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but it's... Um, no, I mean, I think it's wonderful. I mean, I think the way the game has evolved and it's changed, I mean, there's little wonder I think I'd be doing cartwheels and, uh, and, and going around hugging teammates if I score goals in the, in the modern game. I think uh, there, there are too many of the older generation that decry what is going on now, and I, I think it's wonderful. Mm. I think the modern game is absolutely wonderful, and I sit there and think to myself, there's only one place I could come back as in this, this day and age, and that's as a fullback. It's the only place you've got any room, <laughs> you know? And I think, it, for my days, when you say you could do your nutmeg and have a fag and then go walk back to the halfway line, I think those days are, are, are long gone. Uh, it's, it's now a very, very serious and great business. What do people most remember you for? Um, jumping over mini motor cars. <laughs> and dare I say it on television, at my age I'm grateful to get a jump in one from time to time. Now. <laughs> how, Ronnie, from your perspective, how has it changed football f from 30 years back to what you watch out on the park now? Yes, it's, I think it's changed dramatically. Um, there isn't now the man-to-man -man marking that we used to do in my day. We used to get the outside right against the left full back. I used to mark the inside forward. Colin would be marking the centre for, centre forward. And it was his job or my job to mark that man. And it isn't that now. It's, it's uh, anybody um, that wants to move around, they can move around. And it's not their responsibility. It's interesting to hear you say that. We thought we'd invented man-to-man -man marking, Alan, didn't we? But you see, it was happening a long time ago, wasn't it? And there's not the individuals now that there were in my day. Um, there wasn't the Brian Douglases. There wasn't. There isn't the uh, Georgie Bess or, or um, the Tommy Finney. You mean individual the, talent or yes, characters? Yes. 
well, there's that as well as uh, the characters as well as. But there wasn't, it isn't all now, uh, like, it's like a two-touch uh, game now. Mm. You, you kick the ball and he pushes it on and he touches it and he pushes it on. It wasn't that there uh, in my day. Do you agree with what Duncan's saying? Though, it's still a good... It, it is a great product. It's a great, it, it's great to see it and it's, it's the greatest thing in the world to come and see Black and Rovers play. It is for me. And uh, I think that, um, this, this type of football would uh, have also been all right in my day. Would you, liked, versa. would you have liked the opportunity to play today? Yes, I would. Yeah. It's just wonderful to be able to play. And I think in my day, there would be still good enough to play in this type of uh, football. And, and vice versa, these lads would be able to play in my day because yes. you're adaptable. And the comparisons are nonsense, really, aren't they? Oh, because yes, you yes, just, yes. You, you can't... Where, where are the questioners? Who's got some more questions for me? Gentlemen here. Yeah, it's just uh, about goalkeepers. just like to put it to the panel. Uh, we seem to have had a lot of incidents lately with goalkeepers racing out of the area and bringing players down. Centre forwards. Centre forwards. Mm. Um, they haven't been really <laughs> penalised. Uh, <laughs> send them off, he said. If they're sent off, uh, the goalkeeper can be replaced <coughs> now. I just wondered what the thoughts were and if the goalkeepers weren't allowed to come out of the area like they do in five-a-side football. Because if they brought a player down then, it would be a penalty in the box. So you're keeping goalkeepers in their area? I would, yeah. 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 That's an interesting thought. We've had lots of variations on that all season, but not that one. What about that then, Colin? Goalkeepers have to stay within their area. Who's that more difficult for? Um, I don't think that's a very feasible way of doing it, to be honest. Uh, I think goalkeepers have, you know, for as long as the game's been played, they've been allowed to come out of their area without touching the ball. So I, th I think that's got to continue. Um, maybe the back pass rule has had something to do with it. You know, um, you, you knock the ball back. If the striker's in there, he'll stand there, he'll try and play offside because if the ball comes back right away, he's, he's in an offside position where it's killing the game just as much sometimes as the back pass itself. What are your thoughts so, on that, Alan? The, 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 the rule as it's evolved since it changed about 18 months ago, is it better now than it was? I think it's better for forwards because there's always, there's always a chance in a game where you're going to... The goalkeeper's going to miss kick it and the, the ball's going to fall to you and going to get half a chance. Um, from a personal point of view, um, I've certainly scored, I think, one or two since that occurred, so I'm, I'm very happy with it. But what about the, fr the frustration of, of the, uh, and the confusion as well of players leaving a chase with a goalkeeper as the ball comes back and being caught offside? And the stoppage is almost as great now as yeah. you would have had yeah. anyway, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Sometimes, I mean, you can interpret that by being not interfering with play. I think I had one last night. Um, my Graham Rousseau was, was running through and I was um, judged to be offside. And I wasn't interfering with, with play, but I was the last man in the, in the line to give me offside. Um, Did you tell him? No. <laughs> <laughs> and what did you say? <laughs> OK, question on the front row I had, didn't I, down here? Yes? Yeah, uh, Richard, I'd like to ask the panel, um, do they think that players' agents serve any useful purpose in the game today, or have they overstayed their welcome? Let's ask Duncan McKenzie. Well, in my days, there weren't too many agents. There were one or two, of course, that, that would come around um, uh, to the various clubs. And at the time, they would usually act as an agent for the club as a whole. Kit deal, a boot deal, that sort of thing. One or two of the top players did have a personal agent. I think it's become more and more uh, a, a modern thing. I'm not anti-agents at all. Um, I can remember the, the lad Curry that came up from Barnsley to see Cluffy. He wouldn't deal with his agent. And when he's gone in and uh, somebody, this, this guy's knocked on the door and Cluffy's given it the, uh, come in, young man. <laughs> and, and, and he's gone in and he's introduced himself as Curry's agent. And he said, well, uh, go outside, sit in the corridor and send your young man in to see me. <laughs> and he said, no, you don't understand, Mr. Clough. Um, I negotiate on behalf of the player. He said, in that case, young man, put him back in your car and take him up the motorway back to Barnsley. I'm not going to deal with him. And I think that is maybe one extreme to the other. You know, uh, there are certain these lads here will tell you that uh, the agents have been most helpful to them. And I think in this day and age, it's getting so upmarket in terms of um, what is required for players. I think this is the nice thing. They're getting better advice than they've ever had. They're getting advice on what to do with the money, where to invest it. And I think it's not like the old days of an agent who would just get you the boot deal and the, and the kit deal and try and get you a few bob from one area or another. I think now it's a, it's a full management uh, package that the players receive. And I think that the PFA are getting involved now, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, they do, yeah. The, the PFA do a, a, a tremendous job. 
But it must be quite frightening for a player of tender years to sit down in that sort of situation, Alan, with a, a big personality manager and, and try and negotiate his future. Surely you need some help in those circumstances. Yeah, I think you do. I think it's a, the hardest thing in the world for a 16 or 17-year-old kid to go and sit in front of, say, Kenny Daglish, who's, who's probably been his boy hero. Um, so I think, yeah, they, they, they do need some help. Um, and as I said, the PFA do a great job there. Yes. Gentlemen here. My question concerns the fixture pile-up at this time of the season. What will the panel do to alter the programme of football to try and avoid the pile-ups we get at this time of the season? Which happens every year and we don't seem to learn from the problem, do we? Do. Colin, what, what would your solution be if there is one? Well, if we win the next four games and Man United lose their four, there's no problem, is there? <laughs> <laughs> If you were over at Old Trafford now, facing the same situation as they are... Well, it's a nice situation to be in, to, for starters. Um, I noticed today that they've, they've put back the Manchester United derby back 48 hours. And I would think maybe to a lot of people will think that they'll have Paul Lynch back in the side, that that's going to be, uh, that's going to be good for them. But now they're, they're going to have to do without him when they play Leeds United the following Wednesday. So there's pluses and minuses in both, in both mm -hmm. sides of the fence, really. Um, as far as uh, doing something about it, I think I'd leave that up to the administration department. Uh, they can sort that out. You're just happy to play? I'm just happy, yeah. That's all. There was a suggestion earlier in the season, of course, that we should play the League Cup before Christmas, get it done and dusted with and, and, and finished. Would that help in any way? They do that in Scotland. Yes. And I think at this minute in time in Scotland, uh, they've, they've got the two replays in the Scottish Cup uh, semi-finals, and they're progressing quite nicely. And uh, I'll assure you they've got as bad weather in Scotland as they do, uh, they do down here. <laughs> and worse sometimes. Probably, yeah. Yes. <laughs> OK, we're at Ewood Park with Blackburn Rovers. More in a moment or so. Welcome back. We're at Ewood Park. Big crowd in tonight and uh, plenty of questions on the floor. So let's continue in that vein. I'd like to ask Alan Shearer who his boyhood heroes were. Who were your boyhood heroes, Alan? Uh, Kevin Keegan, uh, believe it or not. <laughs> it's, um, I, I remember once on his, on his debut queuing for six hours before his, his debut against uh, QPR at St James's Park um, and he obliged by scoring the winner. Only Keegan or were there others? There were others but uh, he, was the, he was the main one um, obviously with him, with him playing for Newcastle um, was a big factor in that. Not Kenny Dalgleish? He was a good player. <laughs> <laughs> a little by little it's rubbing off isn't it? Sorry. It's sharp. <laughs> Very sharp. Uh, where's the next gentleman? Down here. I'd like to ask the panel if they think the nation believe now that Blackburn Rovers are a big time club instead of a back, backstone Lancashire cobble club. Well, everybody thinks because, after all, there's only two teams after Blackburn Rovers that were a founder member of the Football League and a founder member of the, of the Premier, Premier League. League. And that's Everton and Aston Villa, and we were the third. I was just one. about to ask Duncan if he knew. <laughs> <laughs> Gordon, you've done four and a half thousand miles in a month. You're travelling the country, top to tail and side to side. What are people saying? They're, it's definitely a big club now, Blackburn Rovers. There's no doubts. I mean, uh, and I know we've talked an awful lot about um, Alan this evening, but that was part of the credibility sort of build-up to it all. Uh, in the first place, I don't think people really hooked on up and down the country to the Jack Walker Millions. And that, you know, we've heard it before, there's, yes. there's chairman up and down the country, they're going to do this, they're going to do that, it doesn't happen. Here, when they started to see it happen, um, the most difficult thing was, was that, if that's Ron Atkinson, tell him, I'll be back there later with you. <laughs> <laughs> but, no. For the money. Uh, honestly, Ron, Aston Villa are a big club as well. <laughs> But, you know, I mean, one of the problems you have with the, with the Jack Walker Millions is the credibility only comes home, not with a stadium, not with a town, with his, but with the players that you can attract to that club. And I think the vital cog in the wheel was getting the first one to sign for the club. Mm. And at the time, the one man that everybody wanted, that everybody wanted, that Manchester United wanted, that Liverpool wanted, was this man sat here. And I think Kenny saw that as the vital cog in the wheel. You get Shearer to sign for Blackburn Rovers, then the rest of the Football League want to play for Blackburn Rovers. And then the second one comes, the third one comes, and the nice thing is, and it's happened to me, and I swear to you, I'm not going to mention any names, players at the top flight have said to me, 
you know, I'll come to Blackburn, I'd love to go to Blackburn. And I think that is the proof in the pudding, that Blackburn is here and is here to stay. There's no guarantee to success as silverware, winning league championships, you can't do that, even if you've got all the best players in the world at your club, but you know that at least you're on the right line and the possibility is there to compete with the very best, and that's what we're seeing. Ronnie, do you find this sort of conversation strange? Because Blackburn Rovers were a big club, weren't they? For a good deal of time, and then it all ebbed away. Yes, um, I can <coughs> envisage that in about two or three years' time, they'll be even greater. Because these lads here are only in the 20, early 20s, and they haven't even reached maturity yet. Well, one of them, Colin's pulling some funny faces. Is it? <laughs> He only looks at them. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but uh, in, in three years' time, when these lads get to, say, about 28 to 29, will even be greater. Now, it can't be even any greater than it is at the moment. I've never known anything like it. And uh, in all my years that I've been with Blackburn Rovers, this is the greatest season we've ever had in our lives. Mm -hmm. So the answer to the question is yes. <laughs> Can I, can I just throw one in there, Alan? Can you sustain it? It's all very well seeing it come up around us, this, this magnificent stadium, and, and here we are chasing at the top as far as Blackburn are concerned, but can you sustain the growth? Well, as Duncan said, you can't guarantee anything in football, um, but we'll sure as give it our best shot. Um, but the thing that people forget is that we've only been in the Premier League two seasons. This is only mm. our second season, and for what people expect of us now, it's quite remarkable. Um, we, we, we'll keep on going. Um, we'll, we'll give it our best. As I said, we might not win anything this season, um, but what we will have won is, is success in our own right. Um, I think we only need another win to guarantee a place in Europe, um, and that is some achievement for, for, for Blackburn Rovers. And that was the objective at the start of the season, presumably, to qualify for Europe. Everything else after that's a bonus. Question is, gentlemen down here. Good evening, Richard. Uh, I'd like to ask the panel, how important do they feel that the manager's role is as regards to discipline, uh, certain events at Manchester United prompt me to ask this question. It's a good one up until you said that. Makes it difficult now. <laughs> <laughs> Makes it very difficult. How important is a manager's role in terms of discipline? Who wants to take that? Duncan. Well, I am. <laughs> <laughs> well done. That was great. The most disciplined player here, yeah, and you're asking him that question. Um, I think, yes, I mean, it's obviously, it's a, it's a very big role. I mean, it's not just the role that... Uh, uh, a manager uh, just sees it as part of his job. It's also what you seem to be doing in the eyes of the general public. Um, everything now is scrutinised on the televisions, uh, uh, what the players do. Uh, and I think that most managers actually do see that as a big part of their job. Take the necessary discipline. I think you see great discipline in what the players actually do on the pitch. Uh, I think it's unfair to mention a, a club when uh, they perhaps had a couple of, of incidents occurred in quick succession. I think you look over a, a period of time, and I think the discipline throughout football now, considering the pace, is, is absolutely first class. Mm. And I think a lot of that is down to, to the managers. They can't tolerate it. They can't afford to be without him for a couple of games or without him for a couple of games because of uh, a couple of misdemeanors. So, yeah, it's, I think it's a vital, vital cog in the wheel is, is the discipline angle. What did Cleffer used to say to you about discipline? Well, Clough is disciplined, what's that mean? You, he, he would never, he wouldn't tolerate you if you were injured, for starters. That was the first start of the discipline. <laughs> I mean, you, if, you, if you had your leg in a plaster, you were still cheating, you know? I mean, that was the way he saw it. But uh, with the discipline with Cluffy, you never knew where you stood. The discipline with Cluffy would be he put his arm around you and say hello to you one day, and he'd walk past you as if he didn't exist the next. So you kept on your toes all the time. And, of course, Peter Taylor went behind him and sort of said, he don't really mean it, you know, <laughs> what he said about you. And, and, and he would bull you up again. But it, it, they all do it their own way and the, and the combinations. I mean, the, Shankly was the greatest one. He was the one that started all this thing. You can't win without the discipline. And Shankly was the one where he got each player believing that he was the most important cog in the wheel. You know, mm. And they all believe this. And after a couple of years, of course, they realise he said the same thing to every player in the club. <laughs> uh, and then suddenly it loses a little bit of it, but... That's when he moved them out, of course. That's right. Colin, well. amongst ourselves, what's it like working for Kenny Dalglish? <laughs> it won't go out of this room. <laughs> yes. 
<laughs> it's, I mean, when I, Alan was asked the question about uh, his boyhood heroes, uh, he mentioned Kevin Keegan. I'd hold my hand up and say that the gaffer was one of the players that I did admire as a kid. Crawl, crawl. <laughs> <laughs> but in saying that, as, 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 and, as, as and, quite an old youngster, I mean, you sorry, of quite senior years when he was your hero. Then he's not that old, is he? Well, no, but I can't. No. Crawl, crawl. He still managed to, <laughs> still managed to not make players in training. You know, um, it's 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 a big thing for me, really, because uh, he holds such a high esteem in Scotland. I mean, even when I played there uh, the other week against Holland, the manager came on the pitch and he got the biggest uh, roar of the evening, really, when he, when there was a, a centenary for the, for the players of old that came on the pitch. It was really fantastic. But uh, I think everybody gives him the respect that he, he commands. And uh, it's a worthwhile exercise that we can all play and train underneath him. You know, it's a fantastic experience, really. And I think there's a lot of people and a lot of kids especially would wish to be in our position. I don't wish to get bogged down with this one because it's a, a, a difficult subject in many ways for you, I know. But uh, people talk about yourself and, and what a good disciplined defender you are now. How at times perhaps you used to go walk about looking for the goal you haven't scored this season. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what, Just reminded me. <laughs> what a good player David Batty has become in the short time that he was here. Do players respond to him? Because he's been there and done it, is that part of the ability to get the best out of people? Yeah, that is part of it. Um, might I just add to what you've just said, Richard, is that I'm up for suspension this Saturday. Um, I missed the game at Southampton, and the last suspension that we had was this time last year when I missed the Sheffield United game. So I think for the, in the last two seasons, we've one player's missed two games, notably myself. I don't think it's too bad in respect of the hurly-burly Premier League no. that we're playing in at the minute. Um, so maybe what you're saying is right enough that going a stage further as to what uh, the respect in, that you give the manager um, has been shown out in the pitch. What about 30 years ago, Ronnie? How important was the manager then? Has it, has it changed a great deal? I don't think so. I don't think so. I think uh, you had to discipline yourself in my day. Um, we had rules that we couldn't go out on after Wednesday before a match. Um, you certainly couldn't have a drink after Wednesday. And I, I don't think it's any different t today. I think you went out and you had to discipline yourself. And um, I'm sure these lads are in the same boat. Mm. Mm. Did, was, was the manager a, a fearful character, though? Were you frightened of him when you bumped into him around here, as Duncan was saying, with, with, with Brian Clough? Did, did the manager have that sort of aura about them those 25, 30 years ago? <laughs> Well, I was under about eight, eight uh, managers, and... Um... <laughs> Duncan was under 88. It was, yeah. <laughs> And they all got the sack. I think that's why they left, because the, the, a lot of the boys weren't uh, very disciplined, and uh, that's why we had eight managers. But, um, yes, I, I think you've got to have discipline, but like I was just saying two seconds ago, you discipline yourself. Yes. And uh, that's the most important thing. Fair comment. Another questioner. Where are we? This young man down here pulled me up, didn't he, a moment or so ago? Mr Shearer's friend. I'll be back to you in a moment. Uh, I'd like to bring Ronnie in again on this one. Uh, Ronnie, um, hiya. How are you? I haven't seen you for a while. Nice to see um, you. In these <laughs> days of three and four and five million pound players, what would you rate you be worth today and yourself such as, and such as Brian Douglas? Well, talk about Brian, Ronnie. It's more difficult when you're talking about yourself, isn't it? Um, for me, little Brian Douglas. Uh, for me, he was a real genius. I think he was possibly the best Blackburn Rovers player ever. Why do you put uh, a, a fee on him? I don't really know. I don't think you could. Can I chuck um, another one at you? George Best. What would George Best be worth? Well, uh, again, George was a great... What would you... Put? In my day, there was a, a lot of them. You had the Tommy Finney's, you had the Stanley Matthews, you had the Georgie Best, you had um, the Bobby Charlton's. I mean, they, they were twice as good as I was. I mean, how would you put on a, a price on their heads? I don't really know. You can't really judge it. Uh, let's impossible. throw it back. What would you say? Brian Douglas, minimum five million. Minimum. What about George Best? What would George Best be worth today? Similar. 
similar. Cool. It'd be a bargain at five, I'll tell you that, wouldn't it? <laughs> 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 yeah. You could get him to play. <laughs> if you could get him to play, the gentleman said. <laughs> he watches this program, you know. <laughs> Who was the best manager you worked under, Duncan? Um, I, I, funny enough, I mean, one of the ones that always springs to mind is little um, spoken of in this day and age. I mean, when you talk about most of the things we were talking about, discipline, hard men for defenders, to manager was Dave Mackay, who was a great, great motivator. And uh, I thought it was wonderful playing under Dave. I really did. I mean, he would literally be um, geeing you up from the touchline. He'd be running up and down the touchline and, you know, shaking his fist and encouraging you to, to, to sort of do your own thing. Um, found him a great manager. But in terms of price, oh, I mean, you about talk about the price of players, this day and age, and old players, it's very difficult. I mean, I'd be worth millions and millions and millions. <laughs> <laughs> you were. Cumulatively, you I were. I know, Blimey. dear me. Where at Ewood Park, back in a moment, so, on that subject, should, is what, it? What would Alan Shearer be worth today? <laughs> <laughs> Yes, 3.3, as I said at the start, sounded a lot, didn't it? But not now. We're at Ewood Park. More in a moment or so. And he mugged me, so I'm going to return it. I thought it was. It just hasn't aged. That's what threw me. It's Glenn Keeley, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so what's the answer to the question, then? What would Alan Shearer be worth? Could anyone put a price on him? I don't know. I don't know if you could. I think he's the best centre forward in Europe, personally. I said he's the best centre forward I've seen in 25 years of playing the game. And, and I've seen some good ones and I've seen some of the ones they've talked about. But I haven't seen the, uh, as complete a centre forward as Alan is at, at that level, who's so good at everything he does. Mm. Fair enough. Lady down the back's got a question for us. It's a fair old walk at this stage in the program, but we'll come and find it. Here we are. I promise faithful when I come on here, I'll ask about Jason Wilcox. I want to know how much he's worth now. Jason Wilcox, is he and your favourite? Yeah, yeah, he is. Yeah. And how many of Alan's goals have been due to him? Jason Wilcox, how much of a debt this season to Jason then, Alan? He's, he's done tremendous, as has the rest of the players. Um, as, as you probably know, I'm always the first to thank them who create the goals. I couldn't score the goals without the rest of the lads. Um, and he's, he's been a big, big part in my success this season, as has Mike Newell, as has Stuart Ripley. Um, without them, then I wouldn't have scored half the goals that I have scored. Gordon Strachan said last night he hasn't seen a team in the country better at providing crosses. Would you agree? From both sides? Without a doubt, yeah. I mean, they're, they're, they're tremendous at that. Not only that, they get the credit for the, for the crossing of the balls they do as well, but they don't get so much of the credit for the working back they do. I think that's part of a, a winger's job now. Yeah. Um, Changing the subject uh, completely to referees. Oh! Yeah. <laughs> Every week. <laughs> One of the things that's uh, at each match there is an independent assessor that marks the referee. What I want to know is why is a top ten of referees accumulated points per game displayed in public? So anybody knows who the top ten are. Before the United game, we were saying, let's hope we've got a good referee. How the hell do you decide who the good referee is? There's no information that's published in the papers, and yet somewhere hidden is this top ten of who are the good referees. Well, Alan will tell us. He knows them all intimately, Alan. <laughs> <laughs> all my best friends, aren't they? <laughs> yes, they are. That's not a bad point, though, Duncan, is it? That if we had that sort of information... Yes, that's right, but he would put them again. I mean, it, it, you can open up a right can of worms about referees. I mean, uh, uh, yes, they do influence the outcome of certain games. I mean, I'll accept that. Sometimes it can be a mistake, but I still think that if you look at the whole picture, uh, really, we're looking at a situation with referees that it is the human error. Mm. It's that thing. I, I do think if there's one thing I've always thought we should do is if we're going to change anything at all regarding referees is bring in the rugby league idea that any descent and it's 10 yards. And I think you would cut out an awful lot of trouble there. Just leave the poor old referees alone. Yeah, but sure. referees, I mean, we've, 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 had, we've had some great referees. I mean, none more than one of your mates who's on here all the time, Neil Midgley. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Disallowed a goal from Coventry's in the cup. That's final. right. Yeah. 
quite right too. Mr. Shearer's friend. It's normally one. <laughs> it's normally one question each a night, but we thought we'd make an exception. I'd like to ask Mr. Ronnie Clayton a question. Why don't you become a manager? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, <laughs> It was strange that uh, in my day, we, uh, Blackburn Rovers went on tour. And also the England team went on tour afterwards. So we always missed going to Lily Show, uh, where they had the management courses and, and the training courses. So it wasn't what you knew, knew, it was who you knew. And we always missed out. All the internationals fell out. If you looked through... Um, all the leagues and all, all, all the managers, there's not a lot of international footballers made a manager. Very, very few. And it's because they never went on these courses. And it was what I've just said two seconds ago. They didn't, they didn't get to see the right people. If, if, if you'd been given the chance, would you have fancied it? Would you have liked to have... No, I don't think I would. I would... I'd, 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 I was a, a family man, and, I, and to be very truthful, I wouldn't like to be going uh, to a certain uh, club, staying there a few years, having to go and try and find another job in football and, and changing uh, houses. No, I, I'm a family man, and I wouldn't want that. And a Blackburn man. Thank you, yes. And beautifully asked as well, by the way, young man. Terrific, smashing manners. Just one to so follow that. that. Just one to <laughs> Alan, really, about the recent international at Wembley. What did the conversation go like between you and Schmeichel? <laughs> that man obviously can't lip read, can he? <laughs> <laughs> I think he was a little bit annoyed at me carrying on when I, uh, when I didn't hear no whistle. I promise you I didn't hear a whistle. <laughs> Kicked the ball in the back of the net and he had one or two words with me. And it continued here, didn't it? Did we but I had off? the last laugh, didn't I? You, you did have the <laughs> This gentleman down the front here has been waiting a long time. When are British football clubs going to stop treating disabled supporters like second-class citizens, not including Blackburn Rovers? Well, yeah. I agree with that, Bob. Good question. <laughs> as, as somebody not involved playing, Duncan, can I throw that to you now? It's something that does come up time and time again. Yes, it does. I mean, I heard um, on, on the David Melder show, um, there was uh, somebody with, somebody with uh, a blind person was on saying that you know, they'd, they'd taken away the, the, the commentary for the game. I, I, I think now we're into an age where there's so much money involved. It's such a huge business mm. that really we should cater for people that are, are not sighted. We should um, cater for people that are in wheelchairs. A lot of the very big clubs uh, as you're aware, they, they do. I mean, I know when uh, I go to Everton quite, quite a lot and, and, and they were a particularly caring club uh, uh, regarding that sort of thing, as are most of the big clubs that can afford it. When it gets down the scale a little bit, it becomes quite difficult. Yes, we should do more and we should never lose sight of the fact that not only when we allow disabled people to come into grounds, we also need um, a, a, a little bit of pride to come back for these people, a little bit of dignity to be able to have toileting facilities yes. uh, and, and facilities to actually purchase things like cups of coffee and one thing or another and, and not make it too difficult for them. Great. And I think well that said. would be nice. Well said. And this is for Colin Hendry because he's been far too quiet. Yeah, it's, it's a general question that we've touched on before, the speed of today's game. And really, just as an idea, do you think it might be an idea now to help referees and maybe put put forward a proposal to have four linesmen instead of the two. So they could always be up with the game or maybe split the halves in four. It's so fast these days, I don't see how we can expect the officials to keep up with it. Can I bear in mind what's gone on in the past? Possibly. Um, again, I mean, it's something that administration is really going to have a look at to decide upon. Um, going back to the question earlier from the fired at Duncan about uh, referees, I think there is a mark or there's an opening there for professional referees, full-time referees. Um, I don't know if you recall, but one of the games when I was injured, I'd travelled down in the, in the minibus uh, with one of the referees uh, and I'd said to him, you know, how do you fancy about becoming a full-time referee? And he'd said, uh, that's all very well, Colin, you know, but if I have a two or a three-year contract, I've got to give up my 
a full time job to mm. take on, mm. you know, a two or three year contract. And who's to say, you know, by the time I reach the age of 50, that the referees union or whoever it may be that employs them mm. will take them on again. So, I mean, there's, there's definitely an opening there for four linesmen. I think possibly the day might come, like in America, when you've got the video screen, you know, if it's a foul, if it's not a foul. I mean, I even offered Roger Mulford last week if he wanted to go to the same uh, hairdresser as me, but he, he turned it down. <laughs> so. Next Footballers Football Show week tonight, we're in the company of both Terry Venables and Don Howe. Uh, the week after that, we'll be with Manchester United, and we finish the season... <laughs> And we, and we finish the season on the road with Coventry City. A big thank you tonight to Ronnie, to Colin, to Alan Shearer and to Duncan McKenzie. Also to Blackburn Rovers and I'll do it the same when I go to Old Trafford. Good luck for the rest of the season and thank you very much indeed for having us. It's been a great night. Thank you.